Hello, good morning, good afternoon, <laughs> depending on where you are and where you are connected from. Um, I'm Marciana Popescu and I'm very, very happy to welcome you to this last event of 2022, which I think will be the high of 2022 in so many ways. Uh, we managed to actually organize this webinar um, in a very fast way. So I will have to thank again and again our speakers for doing this with us. Uh, but today we have the opportunity to think solutions. You know, her migrant hub started with this concept of we need to understand the challenges, the stories behind the challenges and see what works as well, we did a lot, you know, like digging into challenges, issues that women with lived experiences of forced migration are dealing with. And then we started thinking, okay, how can we take this to the next step? So today we are privileged to have with us two amazing women, leaders, activists, both of them uh, bringing innovation to job development, job training, employment initiatives, trying to think, how can we think inside the box with whatever we have, working with the resources we have, but how can we step outside the box through the solutions we propose? Both these women will actually share their experiences and what they learned from the populations they are working with, from the communities that they actually established, because it's more than just another initiative. You know, what you'll hear today are two stories of community building. So with no further ado, I want to welcome Manal Kahi, founder and CEO of Eat of Beat, an amazing organization that I can't wait to see operating like at full speed again, hopefully soon. And Dr. Kira O'Brien, who is the director of Emma Storch, another amazing initiative. And, uh, you know, like we'll have this more like an informal conversation with the two of them, trying to learn from them, trying to share with them based on what we we'll learn and promote leadership for women, pro from women for women, because this is what this is. We're ending 2022 thinking, how can we really um, highlight stories of women in leadership that can make a difference. So thank you both for coming. Glad to have you here. And I'll start, any of you can start, but what I want you to start with, what I would invite you to start with is share a little bit of the work you do. What got you there? Why did you decide to do this? What, why work with the populations you are working with? Okay, and then we'll move from there. So. Whoever wants to start. I, I can start and Marciana, first of all, I wanna thank you for, for hosting us today. Thank you for this amazing introduction. Always a pleasure to be, you know, I feel like we are part of this community. So that's always an honor and the pleasure to feel, to feel part of uh, this community. Uh, I know uh, you've probably, you were mentioning that we're, we're ending 2022. We're actually ending 2021. It feels like you're, you're ahead of, <laughs> you're already ahead of things, but I, I like how, how fast paced you, you, you always are right even in organizing this it's always going very very quickly so it's wishful thinking on my part i think it's wishful thinking but no, is, we're is. ending 2021 <laughs> thank you and we are launching together 2022 a little bit absolutely. early <laughs> absolutely and hopefully it's going to be way way better than than 2021 uh, was um so maybe to start by answering your question i'll give you some context on who we are as as a company at eat of beat why we got started and kind of answering your question on why we chose to work with the population we, we work with basically, or why we're part of this community in, uh, at large. Uh, we at Eat of Beat deliver authentic meals that are entirely conceived, prepared and delivered by refugees who, are, who have recently resettled here in New York City. Uh, we basically tired, uh, <laughs> hire uh, talented home cooks who happen to be refugees by status. We train them to become professional chefs whenever that training is, is uh, lacking. And then we deliver their food the way they make it at home to our customers at home or at the office. 
We initially started off as a catering company. So back in 2015, we started as a catering company. We've had to pivot three or four times, especially with COVID. I'll tell you a bit more about that um, later during the conversation, just so, so we don't take too much, uh, too much time now. Uh, but basically today we're still a food company and we're still, we still operate around that uh, premise of three main goals. The first is to create quality jobs for talented refugees who want to be in the food industry. The second is to build bridges between us cooking at our kitchen and um, our customers having our food at home or at the office. And finally, the ultimate goal for us is about changing the narrative around refugees, around immigration to a certain extent, by showcasing a different and a more positive story, right? It's a story where refugees are the chefs, they are the heroes, they are the ones helping us New Yorkers, Americans discover something new, something different, go off the beaten path and not the other way around. We're actually a for-profit. Um, uh, our chefs are, you know, they're full-time employees. They're part of the, the local economy. They're contributing to the local e economy. Uh, they pay their, their taxes. And this is really the story that we want to tell because it's not a unique story, right? It's a story that's very, very common. And you probably much better than us on an academic level know how, how true that, uh, that statement is. So we really want to uh, show that through food, which is what we do, do best. Uh, I know obviously other initiatives do other things, but for us, it's really through food that we try to do that. And this brings me to my point of why I personally chose, and I'm, I'm assuming your question is more on a personal level, uh, of why I personally chose to be in this space or why we started Eat Off Beat in, uh, in general at, in the early days. Uh, honestly, this all started more from a market gap perspective. So I'll tell you a very brief story. Uh, I'm from Lebanon originally. I came as a graduate student here to, uh, to New York City. Um, no intentions of working in food. I actually had never worked in food. The closest I got into the industry, I, I got fired from a waitressing job back, back in my days. So that, that's how close I got to kitchens. Uh, but basically, when I came here, I was very interested or I was kind of uh, impressed by how popular hummus or hummus is here in New York City, but also very disappointed in how it tastes. Coming from Lebanon, I had very high standards, not very convinced with the product that I was getting here in New York. I started making my own called my grandmother, got her recipe, and that became successful. Anecdotally, I'm not even a good cook and people loved it. So <laughs> that kind of gave, gave me the idea that, hey, there's something there. Maybe there's a gap. We need to bring better hummus to New York City. Uh, and when I started thinking of who could bring better hummus, obviously, I already told you, <laughs> not a great cook. So when we started thinking of who could bring better hummus to New York, uh, for some context, that was 2013. It was the midst of re the refugee crisis back home where I come from in the Middle East. It wasn't a thing yet in the US, but it was definitely something in the back of my mind. Uh, another thing, my grandmother who gave me the hummus recipe was actually from Syria, from Aleppo. Uh, so putting all this together, it was easy for me to say, okay, if you wanna bring good, the best hummus to New York, why not work with Syrian refugees who are recently, who are being resettled here in New York City to bring really the best hummus to, to the city. Um, we never really sold hummus per se, right? That was just the idea that sparked everything. Um, we immediately thought, why not make it more global? Why not have refugees from all over bring all of those recipes that just like hummus are so much better when they're homemade, when they're made by someone who knows what those dishes taste like back home, right? Knows the significance of, of a specific recipe or, you know, it's really a family recipe that they're bringing in. Uh, we saw the importance of that through hummus anecdotally, but we knew there was so much more to it. And that's really how we started out in catering in 2015 with just three chefs in the beginning. And then the story went on from there. I don't want to take up too much time. I, I'm sure we'll get more chances to talk about more of it, uh, to talk a bit more about what happened uh, um, after that. But I just wanted to answer your question on personally why I went into this. It wasn't necessarily because I was personally trying to solve that issue. I wasn't really, that wasn't necessarily something in the back of my mind. I did see a market gap. Uh, and I did not, I wasn't necessarily interested in starting just another hummus business, but I was interested in doing something that was both socially impactful and in a way brings better hummus, right? Or better food, why not? I'm, I love food. So that kind of solved the uh, two problems at once. So that, that's really the approach uh, we had uh, when we started. That's amazing, Manal. And I, I heard this story before, but every time I hear it, it's so inspiring because, you know, it's, it's a story of food and community and stories weaved together to bring 
better things for everyone, right? It's also interesting, I just now realized that you started in 2015, and that's the year when I started my close work on forced migration, you know, going to Europe, seeing the influx of forced migrants into Europe, many of them, most of them at that point coming from Syria. So it's interesting to see like, you know, how paths converge without even realizing, you know, we meet people that went on similar path, even though they might have done it in a different part of the world or on different path that touches or, or creates, uh, you know, roads into the same community. So thank you so much. And I'll come back to you because I have a few more questions, but um, Kira, what about you? You're muted. There it is. Two years into this and I'm still losing <laughs> screens and staying muted. Um, but hi everyone, uh, my name is Carol Bryan. My pronouns are she, her and hers. Um, and I am so excited to be here and be a part of this conversation. Um, and now I am profoundly hungry. So thank you, Manal, for that. <laughs> um, let's talk of hummus and I live in Astoria so I can just pop outside. Um, so I, um, part of why I'm really excited about this conversation is for me personally, this has been a bit of a full circle. Um, I am a social worker by trade and I actually graduated from um, Fordham's Graduate School of Social Service, um, where I often like longingly looked at Marciana's classes in the uh, course book and was like, I want to take this class. Um, and I never got a chance. So this is just such a gift for me. Um, and as an organization, we believe so strongly in building partnerships and building community and building relationships that um, being able to be here and start this conversation, we're also really looking forward to uh, welcoming Chloe, uh, who is one of the MSW interns that works with Marciana into our organization as an intern this uh, spring as well. So again, thinking, uh, feeling a lot of gratitude for the relationships um, and community that her migrant hub has created um, and the conversations that we're having. Um, so as a social worker, my career started in refugee resettlement. Um, it's funny, I feel like we've all been like ships in the night. Um, I started uh, at the International Rescue Committee in 2012. Uh, and then I was actually there while Manal was having some conversations with some of my old colleagues um, and Eat Off Beat was getting started. So I definitely, I had the great pleasure of sampling some of the early menus there and it was just so incredible. Um, and I think what has brought me to resettlement work is the same thing that has brought me to social work broadly is the role of empowerment and giving folks the tools that they need or would benefit from to navigate and thrive in the environments that are so rapidly changing around us. Um, so my focus is in um, experiential learning and refugee resettlement, which made Emma's Torch a really natural fit for me. Um, and at Emma's Torch, we focus on um, refugee empowerment through culinary education. So what we do is we are a paid 10 week program um, for forced migrants to experience really deep culinary education training. Uh, that's kind of broken down to two pieces. One is a five week boot camp where we go through all of the basics of, you know, what does it mean to be in the culinary industry? Uh, like Manal, I have zero background in this. Um, I see your fired waitress and I raise you one Maggie Moo cow suit wearing ice cream scooper. That was it, that's all I had. That was my entire culinary background. Um, so I learn as much as the students do. And in the first, so in those first five weeks, um, we have an incredibly talented staff of, um, our, we have a culinary director who does an amazing job helping students understand the basics of technique, but also contextualizing that in what it means to be in a kitchen and to be communicating on a line and to be advocating for yourself in that type of employment. Um, in our, second five weeks people are actually in service so we do have a restaurant that is um in carroll gardens brooklyn that where we have dinner thursday through saturday as well as brunch on the weekends um, where our students are actively on the line learning through doing really kind of honing in their on their skills um and feeling kind of what it means to be in that environment um 
And we also will be running uh, reopening. All of these pieces are kind of contingent on COVID, but from my lips to Fauci's ears, we are uh, reopening our uh, cafe at the Brooklyn Public Library. So that will also give students an opportunity to experience um, culinary, working in the culinary field from that perspective. So cafe, front of house, pieces like that. And I think one of the things that I find so profound about the work itself um, is that it's not just asking people to commit to learning skills. It's not about just, you know, whether or not you have the nice skills or, you know, these kind of very technical pieces, which are very, very important. But what we're asking people to do is to reimagine what their trajectory looks like. It's to shift their identity. And whereas I think oftentimes in our society, we often find it um, easier to put a title on someone else. And I think folks who experience forced migration experience this very deeply, um, being seen and categorized by their immigration status. What we want to do is help people break through that and start to kind of self-actualize um, and see themselves as a chef, right? As, as a line cook, as, you know, as someone who is doing these things and think about this from a career perspective. So really thinking about it in terms of what is the next step as they continue to root and grow here um, and how we can best facilitate that. So 90% of our students are placed within three months um, and they see about a $30,000 wage delta um, in the first six months of their employment after. So we're really here to support students in developing who they are in the city. And I think in this moment, being a part of changing the industry more broadly um, and being a part of building back New York. So we're excited to be here and doing it. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is amazing. You know, and I have to tell you, like my brain cells are like running 200 miles an hour right now because I got some ideas just by listening to you two again. And I'll come back to those ideas for the, the beginning of next year. Um, but, uh, you know, like staying with this, because I think this is so amazing. You know, you talk about, again, you know, rewriting the story and giving people the opportunity to share their own stories, which is what our work wants to be about. You know, it, we all had enough of experts knowing best what is best for forced migrants without ever living with the experience of forced migration, while people that are living with this experience day in and day out in New York City, because he's, here is where we are, um, did not feel that their voices matter. And that needs to change. Like, you know, they are the ones to teach us. And, you know, they are the ones to share a story that's different, that is not based on labels that are placed on them by others, right? Um, and uh, the beauty of your work um, and you know, the way in, in which it converges with uh, one of our main, um, what I say, purposes, aims, is that we are not only looking at you know, okay, yeah, there are vulnerabilities and gaps, as I said at the beginning, but we're looking at strengths, right? And we want people to feel like, yeah, they, you have so much to share because they do. I'm humbled every time the women activists that are working with us are sharing with us and teaching me things I didn't think about, you know, after all these years of working in the field, there's so many things I still have to learn because I did not have a similar experience and coming from that, you know, it's totally different. So, but staying with that and staying with the successes you had, I want to go back to Manal and ask you, Manal, like if you can reflect what, like on everything you did, right? You already said you started with this market gap, which is great, it's brilliant. You know, you start with a need that is not associated with the vulnerability of a population that is labeled just by that, right? You start with a need of everybody else, a need of the market, you know, in a capitalist system that works. But when you think right now, uh, about the program that you managed to keep afloat during COVID and I can see it like succeeding and moving, you know, at a different level and like probably like, bringing it, up, even bringing it up to scale because you can. Um, if you think of that, what would be some of the core elements in the program that makes you think this is what is needed for, entre for an entrepreneurial initiative by women for women? 
you know, it's 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 slightly it's a little tough to answer this question right now, given everything that that's going right uh, for some context, obviously, with COVID, no need. I mean, I think everyone knows by now, uh, like I mentioned, we started as a catering company in 2015. Between 2015 and 2020, the core of our business was corporate catering. Uh, that was cut short. Come March 2020, we got a hundred. We lost 100 percent of our of our revenue basically overnight. Right? It was within a week in March. I remember that week really so so well because it was full on cancellations. We lost 100 percent within a week. But what happened that week? We met with the team, um, and we were like, okay, either we just close tomorrow and that's it. Probably it's likelihood of us opening again is close to, to zero or we keep going. And that came from the chefs, actually, right? The team all together. They said, we can't close. We're here because there's a reason for us to be here. New York is suffering. Who's going to cook for all those people? They felt like they had some sort of a responsibility, right? We called it, uh, we liked like pun intended. We used to say, we want to return the favor with flavor, right? New York was home to us when we needed it most. Now New York needs us and we are here to return the favor. And that's really what we did. Um, we took our best sellers from catering, repackaged them, repurposed them. We put them in a box and we started delivering those boxes as care packages to our customers at home instead of going to the office. That's something that stands until today. We still deliver those meal boxes. Now we have a subscription program actually around those meal boxes where every month you can receive a different menu where you're exploring, uh, discovering new things every single month. It's all made by our chefs at our kitchen. But basically all of that to say that it's really the resilience of the company itself with the processes that were in place that allowed us to make that pivot, the resilience of every single person on the team. Uh, maybe again for a bit more context, everyone on the team, we're all immigrants. Most of the team is, is, is refugees. Everyone has built their lives three to four times over. So rebuilding a business from scratch was not going to stop us. Having to move from being a chef one day to being a driver the next, because now the company needs a driver and we don't have one. Okay, sure, I'll do it. Uh, or vice versa, right? A driver or a delivery person who used to just deliver food has never chopped tomatoes in the past. We ask them to come and chop tomatoes because that's what we need. Today, we're producing a lot because we're feeding uh, 6,000 people with World Central Kitchen or whatever that is. Sure, I'll do it. So no one ever, you know, that adaptability and that resilience of every single person on the team, I think without that, we never would have made it so far. And to this day, right, I'm, I'm talking about it in the past. It's, it's not in the past. It's still in the present because even now, uh, all of our catering last week got canceled. We were starting to get back on track. Now it's it's back to uh, back to zero. We don't know what's going to happen next year. A lot of uncertainty. So having that level of resilience and grit, I think, is definitely crucial. Uh, I would add to that a little bit of passion too, because I think if there wasn't that level of passion, again from myself, but not only from myself, again from every single person on the team, I think of uh, uh, Sarujan, the head of our delivery team, who keeps changing, you know, his scope of work, but sure, we'll, we'll do it and then comes up with new ideas. I'm thinking of Chef Shanti, who again, like today she's making a, um, you know, a menu for 2000 people. Tomorrow she's going to need to change it slightly because now we're not delivering to the office, delivering at home. Sure, she'll do it. So I think that that was really, really uh, important for, uh, on, um, from, from everyone, basically. Uh, last thing I would also mention that I believe is very important when running this type of businesses initiatives programs uh, is empathy, understanding. And I think, again, I'm, I'm sure uh, I, I see you nodding here. I'm sure that there's a lot of that on, on Emma's torch too, but really trying to understand where other people are coming from and highlighting that, not necessarily, we talked a lot about labeling, right? Uh, letting our chefs decide who they want to be instead of saying, um, you know, letting them have their own voice. Uh, they choose the menu, basically. We're not here to dictate any sort of menu. And I think what's really unique about our business is that we're not here to accommodate to whatever our customers want. Although, obviously, we have to do that. At the end of the day, our customers, like, uh, they're the ones we're cooking for. But we're not here to cook food that's traditionally been Americanized. We're actually cooking authentic Sri Lankan food. Or when we say authentic, it's really the way Chef Shanti makes it at home for her family. If she's had to adapt it a little bit because now there's a special ingredient she, do she doesn't find, so she's had to make it. That's how we're selling it. The way she makes it at home for her son Sarujan and for her, for her husband, right? And that's what our customers accept lovingly and, and actually welcome into their lives. And I think this is what really 
really special about the whole uh, situation because it shows our chefs, ourselves, us as a community, that we are welcome as part of this community, the community of our customers. And we as a company see our customers as an extension of our own family. They're part of our community because we're eating at the same table, basically. And having that level of empathy on both ends from our chefs empathizing with our customers and making sure that they're happy with whatever they're receiving from our customers towards our chef and empathizing with uh, whatever challenges they're, they're going with and from every single person on the companies. I think, again, empathy is, is uh, um, very high on that level in getting to success, let's say. Thank you. Is that answering your question? Yes, it does. It does. You actually answered also some of the questions in the chat, you know, like, yes, it is about, you know, people's strength and resilience. That's at the core of that. What else I hear from you? It's it's this concept of like shared leadership. So it's participatory work, shared leadership, everybody's part of the community, everybody matters, they will take charge, and we will embrace and, you know, let them run with the ideas and the creativity that they bring to the table. Um, You know, like this whole concept of empathy is so important, particularly right now, because we are relearning to do our work you know so uh, thank you yes you definitely answered my question i have a, another question that but i'll come back to that let me like turn to kira for a second because kira what i'd like you to share with us is what do you see important for the trainings you run taking into account your participants and what they bring to them, what is important for those trainings to be successful what keeps them being successful because based on what you shared with us they are successful Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that what is making the program successful is a combination of the, you know, the what our students are bringing into the room and our team's ability to listen to that and to pivot around it and say, you know, these are the goals and passions and insights of the folks in the room, rather than us just taking kind of curriculum and mandating that this is what everybody learns. Let's integrate the values. Let's integrate all those special aspects of everyone in that space and elevate those. Um, I think our uh, culinary director, uh, Chef Alexander Harris, does a really excellent job of that by bringing in different aspects of folks' culture into the menus that we create, into the classes that we do, it allows people to have a different sense of ownership over the work that they're doing. Also in the work that we do, we try to help people envision themselves in these culinary careers, which opens up more conversation around what it means to be in separate in these new spaces, what their lives will look like, what their families' lives will look like, et cetera. Um, and by doing that visualization work, by doing that kind of dreaming, uh, you're better able to prepare for the transition as it happens. So I think that's part of where that success of um, we're training you for a career and that is a very tailored and specific experience. This is not just a suite of skills. This is us having an intentional conversation with you about, this is the type of food that I like to cook, yes, but also I have childcare issues at home. So I need to have a culinary job, which will make sure that I'm home these hours. Or, you know, it's really important to me that I am able to, you know, be in a restaurant where they are abiding by some of the same cultural practices that I have. I, it's really important to me to one day own a food truck and have my own career, um, have my own business. It's having these conversations with people that really makes the their education their own. It's not something that we're doing or giving. We are stewarding this information and walking alongside them as they they take it by the hands and they kind of use that to chart their own paths. And I think that's the type of thing that can't happen if you don't have a community where you are articulating mutual respect, empathy, as Manal said, and and elevating the importance of communication and dialogue. Um, if our students, if our staff, if people don't feel safe enough to have the conversation, if they don't feel supported, welcomed, celebrated, then how do you have how do you get that type of information? So I think it's about being really value oriented and making sure that the values of your organization are sitting at the forefront of every decision that you make and that you're articulating those constantly. I think the pivot that we've had to do, and I keep saying the word pivot, it, it feels like after two years, it's just going in circles, but um, 
that, you know, we have gone back onto virtual. Articulating that to our community, our students, our staff in a way that says we are doing this because our value, we value everyone's safety and security. And we want to put that at the center of our conversation, at the center of everything that we do. And that's why we're doing this, right? So being really value oriented in the decision to, to decisions that we're making, articulating that repeatedly to our students. This is not our restaurant. This is our, my restaurant. This is our restaurant as a community. So uh, really encouraging our students to call the restaurant their own. Um, letting everyone feel that this is a space where their voices are valued i think is a really important part of starting a relationship where everyone thrives thank you you said it so beautifully kira and i was thinking yeah we're not pivoting anymore we're pirouetting we became all very good at that you know it's elegant it works and let's hope we can keep doing it with elegance the elements that the element that you also emphasized that manal mentioned as well is this um ownership that's being created, right? So it's it's not about another business initiative, Manal, right? Although I love the fact that this is for profit and it, it kind of changes our approach. And it's not another nonprofit program like Kira. It's, it's different, it's reimagining and it's not only the people that, uh, you know, like benefit or for which the program was initially designed that are benefiting, but we're all benefiting. And I was like, okay, let's see how we can work together. Flexibility seems to be at the core of everything you did and everything you continue to do. This whole concept of reimagining that though pushes me into like a more of a policy realm and Kira knows that uh, that's my area mostly. Um, but I'm thinking, okay, empathy is great and that should be at the core of our policies. And it's great to hear about this, bringing humanity back into the core. The other thing is you are basically working on reimagining immigration policies and reestablishing a focus on integration because so far, none of our immigration policies have a direct purpose saying, yes, people need to, we need to create supports that will you know, help people integrate. It's not about that. It's about self-sufficiency, which without integration doesn't work. You know, so thinking of that, um, I'd like to actually launch another question and then open it to the public as well. But thinking of that, what are some of the challenges that both of you have? You know, it's like this, there are so many barriers. I know Manali work primarily with refugees and uh, to some extent there is some advantage, right? Uh, be, when working with people with a refugee status, right? Uh, that were resettled here and are not doing necessarily with the hurdles that asylum seekers, for example, are doing, dealing with. And then to all that, we add the component of gender. So if you can just you know, share with us, what do you see some of the challenges that we need to work together to overcome? Absolutely, I'm trying to answer how, I'm trying to think of how to answer this question in a way that's uh, helpful for everyone. Obviously, like you mentioned, there are, so many advantages when you're talking about a business in hiring refugees and immigrants. And most of that I talked about in, in my previous answer, right? But grit, resilience, those are all characteristics of, I, I would safely say of anyone who's, who's, who's been moving around, right? And you, you just have that and uh, you've almost been naturally selected to be someone who's really gritty and determined uh, basically to success by the moment you, you show that you, you were able to, uh, to get here to the country. It's definitely much more, challenging when you're in an asylum seeking uh, position for us for instance we i always like to say you can't fight three four battles at once uh, we're really only working with people who have already have their employment authorization we do not want to be you know raise any eyebrows legally we're we're operating really by just so so it it, it stays that there's no risk basically that that uh, we're uh, we're taking there so definitely finding ways um, to um, accelerate employment authorization so that we could hire basically anyone who, who, who needs a job, right? Right now, we do not dare taking any risks. We don't do that, even though in the food industry, obviously it's spread out. Kira, you probably know uh, anyone who's familiar with the food industry, there's a lot of work that's going on the table, which is good and bad because in some cases it's exploitative work that happens, right? Because you barely have any rights when you don't have uh, uh, papers to show. Um, so basically making sure that we're protecting those who are being in a certain uh, extent exploited or facilitating employment authorization so that 
this does not even need to be a conversation uh, anymore, right? Everyone is part of that system that uh, that is equal to everyone. Uh, otherwise, in terms of specific challenges to our business or to our model, uh, we always thought language would be an issue. We always thought there would be with so many cultures. At one point, we had 14 different languages at the, uh, at the kitchen, right? And very limited English among everyone because most of our hires have recently resettled in the US, right? They're still learning English. Uh, one thing we've learned is that that is really not an issue. We've never struggled with different languages. Once people have a common goal that they're working towards, all you need is some sign language. We like to say we speak the language of food, we speak the language of love. And as cheesy as that might sound, it's actually true. It's never been a hassle. People just understand each other. And there's been some sort of a language kitchen that was born at the kitchen. Sometimes you go and you hear words where you're like, <laughs> That's not even English, that's not any language that you've ever heard, right? But it works, people understand it. And what's the point of language if it's not for each of us to understand each other, right? Uh, that's kind of the whole goal. So that has never been a challenge. What is a challenge really from a business perspective though, is one of those basically fundraising, for instance, uh, having the model that we have, Whenever we're talking to investors, you immediately get thrown into the bucket of, oh, this is a cute, business or it's it's a cute nonprofit, for instance, and they immediately discount you as a less aggressive or less profitable business, even though we are at an advantage to our competitors who may not have an, a social impact attached to them, right? But immediately an investor throws you in that bucket and sees you as less aggr aggressive or uh, as if you had uh, less potential. So that has been, I would say, one of our biggest challenges. Um, same for uh, when you're approaching clients sometimes, when they immediately they think, you know, we go to a big company, I'm not going to mention names, we're talking to one of their founders, a CEO, whoever, and they immediately go, oh, this is great, let me connect you to our CSR department. I'm like, no, I'm talking, I want to sell you food. I don't need to talk to CSR, I need to talk to whoever buys food for the company, because that's, we sell great food, that's even better than any competitor that you're buying food from. Uh, the, the food is actually your employees are going to be happy about. Uh, so this is where I would say that's one of uh, the biggest challenges. Internally, obviously, just like any other business, there's all of the other, you know, finding the right logistics for delivery, getting the right space, making sure you have the right culture, all of that, I think, is secondary. It's something that everyone struggles with. You can always find the uh, solutions. But I would say um, knowing how to frame really what we do in a way that shows it as in all of its glory and all of its potential. I hate to say despite its social impact because it should never be a despite. It's actually thanks to, right? It should really flip the perspective. So maybe there might be ways or maybe that, that's something that we as a community can think of. How can we highlight more businesses that are doing that where yeah. the whole ecosystem becomes, it's actually other businesses who don't have a social impact that should switch and become, you know, triple bottom line or whatever yes. that, right? If anything, we need to really flip that perspective and, make other traditional businesses have uh, yeah. have more social responsibility, basically. That sounds great. And actually, as I said, you know, I'm getting ideas as we speak, but I'm thinking, you know, even higher education institutions, how come they don't think of like, you know, contracts through which they would hire you and get food that is prepared. And we can have all this like innovative cafes uh, that would actually be an attraction and provide better food than what is currently, you know, in the school cafeteria. And I know it. So <laughs> uh, I think these are further, further ideas to explore. But thank you. Kira, what about you? Sure. <clears throat> I think I can echo a lot of Manal's sentiments. I think um, being a nonprofit social enterprise, there are the logistical challenges and those take a part of your brain. But I think what takes the greater aspect of the heads and the hearts of our staff and our, our team is elevating not the challenges that we face, but using our work as an amplifier for the challenges that our community yes. faces. Um, <clears throat> and I think that it, one of the ways to think about this more broadly is that if you are not seeing immigration um, and the lack of support and the lack of infrastructure that is created to make that integration easier if you're not seeing that as a major issue you have no idea what you're missing you have no idea how much better your life will be if we are able to welcome more people to our community it also means that you're not paying attention that's just what there it is you know and i think that thinking really strategically about what it means um to have policy that welcomes individuals so that nonprofits um, and 
community organizing and um, other different types of collective aid, these should be pieces of our society that support and amplify and continue work that is already being done, right? So it, I feel like in some ways, our organizations are currently putting a finger in the dam, whereas what we wanna do is use our capacity to continue to elevate, right? So I think it's, and that's a really hard part about being, especially in um, contextualizing our work in the first three, four years, uh, the majority of our students uh, have been in country under five years. They're between eight and, 18 and 65, very varying levels of English um, from all over the world. So, you know, being at a, a juncture where they are not able, they are not receiving the support that they need more broadly from the, the powers that be um, in terms of a policy context makes it really hard for them to be fully present and take the most of the opportunity that we are trying to give them. And I think that some really clear examples of that are the lack of child care options, um, that especially for women, that has been a critical um, issue that we have been engaging in conversations around. Um, also labor practices more broadly um, and the way that this population is continually oppressed by um, the way that um, different industries are able to use and abuse um, immigrant uh, labor. Um, and I think that part of one of the ways that we are actively combating against that um, is that our staff itself is really um, has a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, and so we're able to look at this from a really uh, varied lens. So some of our folks are really talented chefs and hospitality experts who can give us that inside um, look into what it means to be in these spaces. Um, some of our staff are uh, social workers and really dedicated to understanding systems and thinking about developing relationships. So the other day we actually welcomed about 20 um, organizations into the restaurant to have a coalition building conversation around what does it mean to support this community broadly? Um, and what does it mean to foster these conversations, to bring people to a table? Um, and how do we collectively organize as organizations and lend our voices as the platform upon which that we can put our community to continue to help them elevate theirs? So interesting you said that because I mean, you touched on two things that I want to kind of close with before we open that. I have, if I have time, I'll come to them at the end as well. But one is, okay, how can we support you? And you you, you pointed to the social work and, you know, like how social workers can actually be influential and, you know, like for the community building, community organizing. And Manal, I'm, all, I'm also thinking of what you said, and I, I, we had this conversation with Kira as well. Um, really making what you do visible and making sure that people, employers that are understanding the benefit, uh, organizations that are foundations that are understanding the benefit of this work, you know, would champion you. And we would bring those stories to light in as much as we can, because I, you know, like I was thinking on the way home, this like after I got my food and medicine, uh, I was thinking, well, you know, there is a, an advantage disadvantage that such innovation, innovative, uh, you know, approaches have, you are successful. So people will move on starting their own businesses, but that's great. How can we establish a community that actually continues to build through them and, you know, expands, right? And then Kira, you mentioned that you had people in your restaurant. That's my idea for the new year. Now come back to this, but first, thank you so much. This was, you know, I, I think we sh should do a, like a whole series and talk in depth about so many of the things you raised uh, and we can work on this together next year. But for now, I want to give an opportunity to our participants to ask questions. So Tanzilia, if you want to open the mic for all of them and bring them all in. Yes, that's great. Um, and here we are. Let's take about 10 minutes to, you know, for questions and answers. And then I'll come back to some of the ideas that I hope we can continue to build on. I'm unmuting people, but people have to unmute themselves, but they have microphone rights right now. Okay. Anybody wants to start? Comments, questions for our amazing women leaders. You can raise your hand, your Zoom hand, or just speak up. Okay. I'll I'll be I'll begin. Hi, I'm in Congress. You know, I'm at Fordham with Marciano. I'm 
you know, I'm really impressed by, you know, by all your work at the Hub. And I, I've heard a little bit about you before. I guess I have a comment and also, I guess, a question. Um, first, and my, my comment is so, this is so important, especially the sense about kind of food. And, and now, and, you know, the holiday season, people think of the past and, and the foods that were really important to them. And I mean, I think it's important for, you know, for migrants, but I think it's important for all of us. And this provides like a wonderful opportunity for people. I mean, you know, kind of like, I guess myself, who was like an ally, who, but who's grown up kind of with an, an American, quote unquote, of the U.S. culture and not knowing much about different food. But to really have authentic food, not kind of Americanized version, you know, but I love hummus and all. But, you know, just buying it at my supermarket, I'm sure, isn't real, the real thing. So, I mean, this is, like, I think, so important to the whole issue of my food. And I think it's a win-win. I mean, for, you know, for the migrant women who work, you know, in, this, in your terrific organization, but also for, also for all of us. But I guess my question has to do, and I'm involved with the Institute of, of, for Women and Girls at Ford, and Marciano is also, you know, one of our members. And... I mean, I think this is very much true of women. Women are very flexible, very adaptable. And COVID tried to really uh, throw you a, a, I guess a curveball, to use an American and not baseball analogy. I'm mean, just unexpected. And I really was taken when you said like, it went, we were at full capacity. And then all of a sudden, one week in March 2020, it went to zero. But you really kind of re regrouped. And even now, that it's kind of a little setback with this new variant. I mean, you really have come together. And I see this is very true about women. You know, often are very flexible, adaptable, can kind of come up with new solutions. But I guess my question is, is I mean, are, are only women involved with this? Or how, are there men? Or, I mean, how does this work out? Um, I mean, I think sometimes, and I know very little about the culinary uh, field, but I think there's some issues that men kind of get in and then they dominate and women are really, you know, subverted. So I guess my question is, you know, are there men and kind of what role do they play, if any? Um, I can start answering that, uh, Elaine. For us, we're not necessarily a women organization. It's not necessarily, like again, like I said, one battle at a time. We realize how problematic the whole industry is it is towards uh, women in general, but that's not necessarily the problem we're trying to tackle today. So we're not necessarily focused on women only. It does so happen, though, that 70% of our staff is women. So we do have men on the team, uh, but uh, it's, it's primarily women, actually. And that's probably, I think you said it so well, it's probably also part of what makes us so resilient. It's all of those women on the team that just uh, have, uh, have their goals. But we, we do have some men on the team who are also incredible, and obviously there's... Um, but just to answer your question, we're not necessarily only focused on, on supporting women. It's really anyone who has a great passion for food. The only criteria we have when we're hiring someone is passion for cooking and a willingness to share your culture through food. The rest is secondary. We don't even, we never, we rarely see resumes. We rarely look at anything else beyond uh, those two. Uh, those two. Yeah, um, similar at Emma's Torch, um, we uh, support all genders. Um, we're a very gender inclusive environment. Um, so we have men, we have women, we have um, trans and non-binary uh, participants as well. Uh, and I think that you bring up a really important point though, that part of what our conversations responsibilities have to acknowledge is that a lot of our folks, regardless of any aspect of their identity, we need to recognize the environment that we're putting them into. Um, so while our environment seeks to be supportive and inclusive and attuned to specific needs. You're talking about New York City's restaurant scene. I feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot of things there um, that are inherently misogynistic and oppressive and that these are conversations that we have to prepare um, our students for, that these are some of the realities of the industry that they will be looking at after they are with us. And so thinking about how we have that, like how we how we acknowledge that this is this is the space that we have here um, and that our employee partners are ones that have affirmed and have the same values as we do. And we ensure that they do and 
And that is a very big part of who we are as an organization is ensuring that we would never place a student at a, in, an, uh, in a restaurant or any aspect of the industry that would in any way be not affirm the same values that we hold. Um, but it's also, again, a part of the advocacy work that we have to do on the back end. So, um, and many of us are on different boards and uh, industry-wide alliances that also continue to kind of fight for greater equity. We also partner with an awesome organization um, called Arab American Family Services, um, who have been coming in to do Know Your Rights workshops, et cetera, for our um, community, which has been a really important aspect in that as well. Wow. Um, and again, you know, like you're feeding into the ideas that you gave me and inspired in me. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I can't wait for this, this pandemic to kind of, you know, seize its grip on us a little bit, uh, lessen it a bit. Uh, but I'm thinking, you know, like what an amazing thing you do have. We were looking for a while for a space where we can actually convene with all our women participants and, uh, you know, bring together, you know, organizations, foundations, you know, so they can learn about the work we do and they can learn about the network we're part of. And now I'm thinking, what a great place. And you mentioned, you know, like, okay, uh, trainings, know your rights trainings. And this is what Her Migrant Hub wants to do, like really open opportunities for, all these amazing initiatives that are spread around the city and the amazing people that uh, are really teaching us how to do this better to come together. So uh, I'm thinking for the new year, let's let's think about this. And once, you know, the pandemic lessens a bit, like maybe we can all come together at your restaurant, um, Cura, and invite Manal and bring some of the food there as well and have like really a good event um, and it could be used for fundraising possible opportunities and it should be used for advocacy as it is extremely important to kind of look in way, in, in, into ways to continue to support you, <laughs> to help you expand and to help others learn from you. Uh, one thing that I wanted to add is like that, you know, like this whole know your rights and know, understand the the the, the, the forced migration context is so important because as you mentioned Manali, you know, here we are working with refugees because we know that at least, you know, paperwork is being resolved for them. Yet in reality, employment authorization is available for asylum seekers and by and large, they do have it yet. Employers, what we learned from them is that they are reluctant from hiring people because that is temporary. And, you know, they are looking at that card as a temporary, instead of looking beyond that at what you look at, you know, the possibility you know, and the real integration that can occur and the learning that can occur that actually will benefit every single person, employers, business owners, you know, foundations and corporations as well. Not only the populations that we think we are here to save. In many ways, what we learned during the pandemic is that they saved us uh, and they continue to do that. And, uh, you know, once we start working together, we can see more beautiful things like the ones that you talked about happening. We do have, no, we don't. Yes, we do. You, you answered already in the chat, another question right there. And actually, you know, like, uh, because we are almost at time, unfortunately, uh, first of all, uh, I, you know, I'd like to thank you once again. And I'd like to thank Manal in particular for helping us sending out uh, Christmas dinners to all our participants at Her Migrant Hub. Uh, thank you so much for, for working with us to make that possible. Um, and I hope thank everybody everybody will enjoy them, uh, you know, because it's, it's I, I had your food again and again, and we made it a per, like a very like we made it intentional to actually have you cater to for them whenever we had events in our department. But now you know we are remote. We'll go back to that. And thank you so much. I'd like you to kind of like you know have a last thought for our participants and say what would you tell women? Because yes, we are. We're not. You know, we are all inclusive, but we are you know very aware. Uh, and we want to acknowledge the additional challenges that women are facing, like childcare, for example, you know, and how can we, you know, address all these other issues. What would be the message that you want to leave the women that, you know, are among the participants here and, you know, beyond that in terms of how can they access you and what do they need to know? If there would be one or two things they need to know as they consider such opportunities for them, what would those be? And just to be clear, are we talking about, um, taking initiatives or, or, or are we talking about them setting up 
It's up to you. You take them, you take us, whatever you want. Got it. I, I'll, I'll do a bit of both then, like on how they can access me personally. Obviously, my email is out there. I'll put it in, in the chat. Please, if you have any questions, concerns, ideas, thoughts, feedback, uh, do send that. I'll send it in the chat for, for everyone. Um, for ways to support us, uh, obviously, getting, you know, today we have three different programs. We still do catering. If you have any corporate catering opportunities, you're always there. We also deliver meal boxes and subscriptions with meal plans all over New York City. We also send gift boxes and provisions nationwide so if you have uh, gifts to send too late for Christmas but if you have something for after Christmas tons of people celebrate other uh, um, uh, other celebrations or other occasions between Christmas and New Year's or even beyond the, beyond the New Year's so please go check out our website follow us on social media we're at eat offbeat across all platforms always helpful to have you follow us and have a conversation with us because again for us the biggest impact we have, is on our community, is on our customers, rather than it is on our chefs. Our chefs, you know, they're, it's us, it's me. We're not necessarily trying to make an impact, or that's not really the point. The point is to have an impact on people who try our food, who try a Katarika curry and say, wow, this is amazing. I am so lucky that these refugees are being resettled here next to me so I can get the chance to try this incredible food. So that's really the, the biggest opportunity, opportunity for us. And I hope you join that community. You come, become part of, uh, of our family. Uh, otherwise, maybe to answer it a bit differently on one thing that women can or should do if you want to go into entrepreneurship, if you want to start your, your own thing. Um, for me personally, I think it's really the biggest thing is getting comfortable with uncertainty. Business, uh, running a nonprofit, it's such an uncertain environment and it's getting more and more uncertain now with COVID. So getting comfortable with that, I think, is one key to success and being ready to keep adapting uh, and evolving, basically. You try one thing, it works, you keep it, you grow it, it doesn't work very quickly, you shrug it off and start something uh, something new. So definitely get comfortable with uncertainty and uh, uh, and keep adapting. <laughs> um, and I will add to that, um, yes, we are always uh, recruiting students, as I mentioned in the chat. Uh, we start new cohorts every five weeks. So if someone reach out, reaches out, we're generally in touch with them within two, three days, they're in um, and able to do a trail, and then we have them um, in class as soon as humanly possible. Um, and I think as much as possible, you know, come come try our food, come come to dinner, come to brunch. Um, we also cater. Um, so if Manal's booked one day for any reason, also there too. Um, but I would say in terms more broadly of, if I was speaking to women who might be um, Asylum seekers uh, who might be interested in this type of work, uh, really think and explore about what your passions are. Don't let the kind of, don't let what has been dictated to you define what will come next. Um, we really seek out individuals who are passionate about food. Uh, a lot of folks will come to us because they're passionate about getting a good job. And I feel that, I hear you. If you are not passionate about food, this will not serve you. So I think exploring our own passions, and I think the biggest piece of advice that I could give to women in this field and in any field um, is build coalitions, reach out to other women, um, reach out to other people, build those coalitions, build yourself a safety net because it might not exist without you. Um, so I think the folks that I see in you know forced migration in general that has done really well often have community around them that is not something that is easily kind of easily created but it's cultivated over time and it takes bravery um, and it takes intentionality so reach out to your neighbors reach out to your friends reach out to us and have those conversations and build your own coalitions thank you so much build coalitions find your passion now that it's possible and Work with us so we can all reimagine ways in which we are a community where people come first, not their immigration status, not their, you know, like challenges that they are facing every day, not labels that are placed on them, but the fact that they are people and they are bringing so much. And it was a blessing for me personally to listen to you and an inspiration. And um, thank you so much for the meaningful work that you do. Uh, you're touching many lives, more, ma many more than you think you are. And we are very lucky to partner with you in this work. 
And I wish you all happy holidays, happy Kwanzaa, Merry Christmas, whatever you celebrate, happy winter, stay safe and healthy and a happy new year, a better new year in which we can continue to work together. Thank you.